I'm Tobin Heath, two-time World Cup winner. And I'm Kristen Press, two-time World Cup winner. <laughs> and this is The Recap Show. This is the first time we'll be watching the World Cup in over a decade. We know we're not alone with how we feel about the way people talk about women's sports. We want to be part of the solution. Having been there many times before ourselves, Tobin and I are going to bring to you what it's like to play in a World Cup, what's really happening behind the scenes, all the good juicy bits. The Recap Show will bring you gal culture at its finest. We all know what bro culture is, but what is gal culture? We're here to define it. This is our narrative, our culture, and we get to tell it our way. Welcome to The Recap. Welcome to the show. LFG. Welcome to episode eight, our final episode of The Recap Show World Cup edition. Thank you so much to everyone that watched the show. And don't miss any upcoming episodes by subscribing today. Now let's start with the sports. It started with 32 teams, and now we have a new champion, La Roja, and that champion is Spain. The World Cup may be over, but the recap show is just getting started. Today, Chris and I are joined by our captain, Lindsey Horan, and the captain of the Jamaican national team, aka the reggae girls, Allison Swaby. But first, Tobin's top things. The Spain thing. The Spanish players had every reason not to play for their coach or their federation, but they played for one another, and now they're champions. Brava. The sleep thing. Watching the World Cup over the past month has been incredible, but now that the midnight and 2 a.m. games are over, I think I'm gonna sleep until the Olympics. Let's hope that the US Women's Ash team doesn't sleep until the Olympics too. The step up thing. An FA chief executive made the totally awesome remark that a coaching move from England's women's national team to England's men's national team is not necessarily a step up. And I agree. However, Serena made 400,000 euros this year to Gareth Southgate's 5 million. So it may not be a step up in skill, but that's a giant leap in terms of salary. The anti-bias thing. Emma Hayes shared during the FIFA conference that male coaches at Chelsea are required to complete six weeks of anti-bias training. Six weeks. Get that training in, fellas. The Tobin thing. I know these are Tobin's top things, but I just wanted to pop in and say how proud I am of her for helping make this show and this segment what it is. That's my top thing. The Infantino thing. FIFA president Gianni Infantino said that women have the power to convince us men what we have to do and to push the door open for equality. And as someone who has been a part of that movement to push against that locked door, let me just say, that is gaslighting and that is the patriarchy. The recap show thing. When Kristen and I decided to make this show, we never imagined you would all support it as much as you do. So on behalf of both of us, thank you. Here we are with the final daily discussion. We are working off of a couple hours of sleep. So we got up really early to watch the final with a lot of excitement and um, a pack of fruit snacks to fuel us through. Um, it is storming here in LA. So there is a lot going on. Um, but Tobin, will you start with sharing general thoughts on the World Cup final. Wow, we have a winner. We have a winner. A first a time champion. winner. A champion. Um, well done to Spain. What? Wow, to what Spain. What an overall amazing tournament. Well done to Japan who beat them 4-0. <laughs> so let's, let's start with England. What do you think went wrong? Well, I, I'll just start with like the, the game started with so much energy. Mm -hmm. Both teams had chances. I mean, England hit the post. There were two really good chances for Spain. And I was like, wow, what a dynamic. This is going to be amazing. Um, and then Spain scores in the, the first half. And, and then I kind of was like left wanting more. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted an England goal. I wanted a Spain comeback. Like I wanted more time. And I felt like we kind of, it was a bit anti- Climatic in the end? Yeah, so like generally finals don't feel that open and free yeah. as the beginning did. But then the last couple of rounds, there's been like three goals, like yep. 
d different energy shifts, yeah. and, and then it, we were sort of just like waiting for that, yes. waiting for England to equalize or waiting for Spain to take the, the lead, and it was actually kind of calm. Yeah. I wouldn't say like calm. I would say more like disruptive to the point of, especially the second half, mm -hmm. like with all the the fouls, like I, I felt like it was pretty disruptive, mm -hmm. and I don't think England ever like kind of got to come back, even after the penalty save that, that Mary made, which was a phenomenal moment. Mary, I love great those tournament. moments. We, we love you, Mary. Um, but well, you would after think that, we didn't get what we wanted from that moment, right? Yeah, you would think that like a disruptive second half would lean itself to England. Um, yeah. But it didn't really. Yeah, let's go let's go through England because I think this is one, you know, Serena, everybody was just like Serena, 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 this whole entire <laughs> tournament, and rightfully so, incredible manager. Her players speak so highly of her. Um, but look, I, I feel like you're as a manager, you would be going through a lot in your head right about now in terms of like the looking decisions. back yeah yeah and i mean like it was an interesting tournament for england cuz they never really like fully like played mm -hmm. like the team that we saw like in the euros mm -hmm. um, which was okay right because they were showing a very strong mentality um, they were progressing through the tournament okay wait let's break this down so yeah. so kira wash gets injured in yep. early stages, and they move from a yeah. four back to a three back. Yes. They then, even when she gets back healthy, she's inserted back in, and they keep the three back. Yes. And then at halftime of this game, for the very first time, they move into a four back. Yes. And what do you think of that decision? In, in just that decision about the the shape of the team. It's tough because uh, when you do that, you also have to change personnel. Mm -hmm. It's not just a formation change. But she did change personnel. Yes, yeah, she did. So she took out, like, and I want to know, I, I want answers to that. <laughs> um, for Rachel, Rachel Daly, who's one of their best players, um, I want to know why she came out. Like, for me, there's only one reason, and that's she picked up an injury. Mm -hmm. um, that was a big one. And then uh, less, like, Russo, like, I think it's it was a very... It was a, a moment, right? You go into halftime 1-0, right? And I think Serena's been very steady the whole tournament with her decision making mm -hmm. she hasn't ever kind of been very like rash flustered. or flustered yeah. and she showed a lot of trust in her players um and their in their abilities and i feel like you go in one zero not a terrible half i i expected you know come out and play a little bit more like go in reassure your players it's one zero like we expected to score in the final let's make this one one and now, and then let's get a little creative Yep, in, I, I, in your decision making. I felt exactly the same. I felt like the drastic nature of the changes signaled like a little bit of insecurity. Mm -hmm. And if you're saying like, oh, they beat Spain in the Euros and they were in a different shape. And if that was in her head, then mm -hmm. that you need to start the game with. Because shifting halfway to me says, I'm second guessing myself. Yes. And I think the, the Lauren James dilemma it was a tough Actually, dilemma. it was tough. You know, yeah. almost, it, and like, she's a special, special player, right? Like, we know from playing with her. But but in this moment, you almost wish it was a three, three game ban because that automatically shuts off that option for you. But because it was a two match, a two game ban for the, the red card, it always was this optionality that felt hard, yep. right? It felt like just another decision that she had to make. Um, but I will say that the moments that you reacted strongest in the match were generally LJ getting out of like a ridiculous amount of oh, pressure. LJ? So we are glad that you were in the final LJ. I mean, beautiful, absolute joy. beautiful game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but I will say then it was interesting because I felt like there were some good changes that happened in the second half. Like they went to a double nine. They threw up Millie Bright, and in that moment, the the thing that works with you go to a double nine to get service into the box. the box. I think that. They went to that formation, and they probably got one cross into the box during that time. And for me, that's just poor execution mm -hmm. of a tactical change. Mm -hmm. Like, every single ball at that point should have been going into the box. And I'm convinced with the players that they had in the game at that moment that they're going to get a scrappy goal off of that. Mm -hmm. But they didn't put that pressure on the back line. And look, it was disjointed. They were fouling, all these things. Um, but in my mind, there was a tactical change that then wasn't... Um, they didn't execute against. Execute it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's shift gears and talk about our champions, 
Spain, yeah. um, now maybe the fifth ever country to win Women's World Cup, yep. and one of two countries to have won men's and women's. That's really cool. Germany and I, Spain. I heard, I yeah. heard that. Um, it's really, really cool. And I think it's kind of interesting because it's, it's to me, there's this shift that's happening in the conversation um, about you know the dominance of the U.S. women's national team stemming from our country investing more in women and like accepting women in sport because of Title IX and the collegiate program, um, and in the last. 10 years, mm. a shift of Europe being like, okay, we'll, we'll have women play too. Yeah. But they already have the infrastructure there to make such rapid yeah. change and growth. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot. And you look at the secession, I think you stated that their first World Cup was in 2015. Was in 2015. They didn't qualify before that. So this is their third World Cup and they won. And then you look at the, the two biggest clubs in, in Spain, in, in Barcelona and Real Madrid, and the amount of players that are coming out of those two clubs that are obviously ginormous like world powers in football it takes nothing and mm -hmm. and look what what they've gotten from just the, just giving a little bit of investment to to those structures it, it's incredible I, I saw a stat even if you add up the english players that play uh for barcelona that barcelona could have fielded a whole whole team for the final. I know. And you know what? I like I don't know the ins and outs of the dynamic of the Spanish Federation and the club system, but my, like what it feels like to me is the feder like the national team is benefiting from investment that's happening at a club, club level. level. Because um, yeah. even if you look at the salaries of the players on Barcelona, they're the highest paid players in the world. Yeah. So there is a like a path for professionalism yep. in Spain. Yep. And the national team kind of just scooped that up and won a World yeah. Cup with it. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And and I think the then the biggest X factor too is, you know, Barcelona winning Champions League. So figuring out what how do you win something? How to win. How to win. And then the other thing picture. is having an icon. Alexia Patelis is literally such an important figure to the Spanish team because we've we've all had them. We we had our Mia Hamm. Mm -hmm. This is for the first time their country has a role model for all these girls that are either playing with her or aspiring to be her that they identify themselves mm -hmm. in her. And if she's not part of this team, even this team in the limited kind of minutes that she had, um if she's not in this squad, this team doesn't win. I love that. I think it's so important because it's belief. And even if you're, you know, Bon Mati, like she's been playing alongside yeah. her for so long. And so all of a sudden you're like, hey, if she's the best player in the world, I'm pretty darn close. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's not night and day. So yeah. like I can do it. Yeah. And that belief actually showed um, people want to talk about Spain just playing the beautiful game. Of course they do. Yeah. But what I think was more important was their resilience. I, I yeah. Their determination. Yeah. They kept they kept giving up leads on yeah. the way and then coming back you're, and you're scoring. You're spot on. You're spot on. I actually don't agree with what people are saying about Spain, about them, like, oh, they keep the ball and it's so beautiful and all this stuff. Like, yeah, that, like, you're not, you're not watching what's winning if you're just watching them pass the ball. Mm -hmm. What's winning is not them passing the ball. Mm -hmm. it, that's, that's always been part of Spain. Mm -hmm. We've played against Spain teams, passed way better than this team. Yeah. A lot more too. That's not what's winning them this World Cup. What is? Capitalizing on chances. Capitalizing. I mean, look at the the Lucy Brown mistake that that happened. Capitalizing on cham chances, belief coming from from behind, knowing that you deserve to be there, that you deserve to win, that you have everything to win. And I think there's this generation that looked really brave. They looked very confident. Yeah, I think that it was an incredible final. Super fun yeah. to watch. Um, you know, the first, second, and third place teams are all European. I think we know we know firsthand how a World Cup changes the game forever. Yeah. I think we're seeing a shift in the game that we're not gonna be entirely sure about how it goes um, for years to come, but I think it's a really strong signal that um, you know it's two of the strongest leagues now in the world yep. that are, have the majority of players playing in this final, um, and there was a big American absence um, of clubs, of NWSL players, no like NWSL making it through the tournament. In the final. Um, so I think what we're going to be unpacking the impact of this World Cup for, for a while, um, but it was a joy. It was a joy to stay up at crazy hours 
and order yeah. pizza <laughs> and kind of lose our minds yeah. and not know if it was morning or night and yeah. be in two different days at the same time for the last month because it, it was a fantastic turn. Hi everyone, we've been overwhelmed and overjoyed by all of your support of The Recap Show. When Tobin and I sat down and began discussing building a media division for our business with the mission to reimagine the way women are seen and experienced in sports, we couldn't have imagined how much fun this would be. To say thank you to the hundreds of thousands of you watching, listening, and supporting this show, we are offering you a special discount to shop our World Cup inspired collection. 20% off the Ridden in the Stars collection with code Ridden in the Stars 20. At Re Inc., intentionality and integrity are at the heart of all that we do. Each piece of our gender free clothing line has been thoughtfully made in the US at a women owned factory with 100% organic cotton. So head to re website.com and use code Ridden in the Stars 20 for 20% off our World Cup inspired collection. Thanks for all the continued support. Now let's get back to the show. We have Allison Swaby here uh, who represented Jamaica in this World Cup. We are so grateful to have you on the recap show. Um, the World Cup is over. We just saw the finals, but um, a big part of our show is to tell stories and to make sure that none of these amazing stories are lost. And um, you have an incredible World Cup story, and I'm so excited for our audience to hear more about it. Um, you had an amazing tournament. You didn't give up a goal in your bracket. You scored your country's only goal against Panama uh, that would eventually knock out the world power of Brazil, uh, which is crazy and exciting, <laughs> and I would love to hear about your experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, first, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy because, um, you know, like, in the tournament, like when it's going on, there's like different phases. So like you get there and you're just like, you feel like you've been preparing, but like you don't actually know what to expect. And then you play the first game and like tying France for us was huge. Like that literally, like after that game, like you couldn't tell us we couldn't go out and get a result against any team. Like we were so confident from that moment forward. And then, um, come to the second game like we were familiar with Panama because we'd played them in CONCACAF before um and so I think like we felt like we had the edge going into that and then also just tying that into how strong we felt after France it was like you know a game that like we knew in my mind we all knew we were gonna win and like I mean it was really cool that I scored the goal but like yeah. truly like I knew someone was gonna step up and I think that that's like been something that's like a trademark of our team is you know, obviously we have a striker that in Bunny Shaw that is like insane and like one of the best in the world, if, if not the best. I mean, but um, we know that like in tough games, tight games, like it's it's hard because every she's got six defenders around her. So yeah. this was a bit of a different situation because she wasn't actually on the field. But I think it was something that we had been prepared for in the sense that like we knew in these big moments, like somebody else has to step up and. Um, I think that that's how we ended up with that result. And then, um, yeah, going to the last game, it's funny because like we felt like we'd already done so much. And I think we looked at some other groups and we were like, holy crap, if we had already had four points, we probably would have been, you know, this would be a great place to be in and maybe not be too stressed about your last game. Um, but yeah, we knew we had to get a result, which was still huge. And I mean, the shutouts, I don't know. I mean, I think we surprised ourselves in that aspect. Um, but yeah, I mean, that kept our hopes alive the entire time. And yeah, it was it was really I think we surprised a lot of people. I think we surprised ourselves to an extent. Um, but I think looking back on it now, like, you know, we believed the entire time, the entire way. And um, but I think that's how the results came. It's so incredible to hear um the duality of like surprising yourself, but also believing in yourself. Yeah. Um, and I obviously know the power of that type of self-belief that takes you through a tournament. Um, so congratulations on that. And I can only yeah, imagine thanks. what it felt like to score yeah. that goal. It's kind of like the belief that like, you know, you, you, <laughs> you don't really say it out loud, you know, you right. haven't really like put it into the, uni like you put it into the universe, but you haven't necessarily spoken about it to everyone. And I think that that it, it was just a reflection of the fact that everyone had that belief in the back of their mind the entire time. And um, yeah, it, it just, yeah, like you said, it was really special to see it like kind of be, you know, a combination of that, of that. But. 
Yeah, I really relate. I remember actually in the 2019 World Cup, there was a moment where I like had the thought like, are we going to win? But I like dare not say it out loud. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was yeah. like, I believe, but yeah. I can't be success. Um, but I think what's even more incredible um, about your story and that belief is that, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now in the World Cup about the increased investment in the global game and how that has led to um, teams having unexpected performances and taking down the world's powers. And I kept saying to that, like, is that is that so? Is that what's really happening? Are federations across the globe really investing more in soccer? And I'm curious to hear your perspective on that. Um, and, and if you think that's a real reason why we had some upsets and some spectacular results this World Cup. Yeah. Um, you know, I think obviously there is a general uptick. And I think that, you know, for us, like I, with my federation, it's always kind of felt like this yo-yo and it's like, you do feel like you, you feel the the glimmer of like, okay, like things are kind of moving. And then, you know, unfortunately there is this kind of like bounce back occasionally. And I think that um, for our team, I think you kind of look at where our players are now compared to where a lot of them were four years ago. And I think that, you know, for, on a club level, um, what they're doing every day, um, the level is just higher. And so I yeah. think that a lot of that experience for our team specifically is what allowed us to find success. Um and I think that professionalism that a lot of us have grown um, into and that experience that we've gotten is is what you've seen, or is how you kind of saw what we did happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, we like in our federation, we have a long way to go. And I think it's it's good, obviously, when we, you know, we go and perform and we feel like we have a little bit more credibility. But, um, you know, in the middle of it, in the three years in between a World Cup, that's really when you see like, is, is that really what's happened here? So I think, you know, the expectation is certainly that there will be increased investment and you're going to see that kind of reflect into the next world cup. Um, but the reality is like, I can sit here and tell you, I don't know from, from our perspective, yeah. what that will look like. And it, it is disappointing. Um, you do wish that like, you know, you could expect to just see that. Um, but um, yeah, I think though in general, though in the rest of the world, I think that you do see it, and but also yeah, you still see a lot of teams kind of in the same place that we are. They kind of make things happen out of nothing, and you look at like the disparity in resources between some teams, and um, yeah, I think that it comes down ultimately to the character of the players and the staff and what they believe in, and I think that's what I would stand behind. Is I I would say that our success is ultimately down to that. Those two things is just our belief, our desire, our professionalism, um, our growth as individuals when we're not necessarily in the program um, and taking that and bringing it back to the national team. Oh, I love that. Um, and I think that like my sense this whole time is like, I don't want federations to get bailed out because teams were overperforming based on the investment. And that's how I felt about mm -hmm. the Reggae Girls. I was like, mm -hmm. do we really want to credit the federation here? Yeah. Because there is a huge uptick in support at a club level. And I think that's really important, like just for players to be able to play at a professional level every day. And that is translating to different results in a global game. But we still have to hold our federations accountable and with the incredible tournament that you had do you feel that you'll have a better voice in advocating for yourself moving into the next cycle yeah I definitely think we'll have a louder voice when it comes to you know seeing those types of improvements and um I mean we have Olympic qualifiers coming up in September for example and for us like um that's obviously a huge thing and um we'll be playing Canada twice and I think that Obviously, you know, if you qualify for another tournament, it's the same conversation of of that, like, expectation that things will be a little bit better. Um, but I will say, like, the success, obviously, like, you know, the media, it draws media attention, it draws outside attention. And I think that's also where a lot of the pressure comes from, because 100%. ultimately, you know, we can go and have these conversations, we have meetings with, you know, the leaders and um, the executives of the federation. And it is difficult sometimes, it is just like, you, you kind of hit a wall, and then you know, something gets put out into the press and people really see how it is and um, from a from a new perspective. And that's kind of the pressure that that gets us what we need. So I think that that's the biggest thing that kind of comes with the success is just having a bigger platform globally. Um, and the eyes on the Federation are just there's just way more eyes, you know, the yeah. the need to do right is bigger in their minds because they're being watched by just a lot more people now. 
Yeah, I really agree um, that so much of the progress that we made in the United States was based on um, just like media and visibility into the issues. Um, if there are a couple things that you're looking for specifically from your federation or a few examples even of things that you think that you uh, lacked during this World Cup, just to paint a picture for people, can you speak to some of those examples? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest issues that we struggled with um, this campaign was getting uh uh, games during international windows. Um, you know, there was a few windows that we passed up and didn't have, weren't able to play games. So we ended up playing like inner squad games or we'd play against, you know, I don't know, like a, a club, a club team or something, um, something that just wasn't really a comparable level to what we're going to face when we go to the world cup. Um, and a lot of it just came down to, you know, mismanagement, like, uh, the, the amount of time that they needed to, you know, properly put on a camp, properly arrange a friendly, like it just wasn't being done correctly. Um, so that was for me and a lot of my teammates, one of the biggest issues was just feeling like, you know, teams are, they have an edge on us because they're just playing more games. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think from our standpoint, it was really difficult because I mean, we played, um, we qualified obviously, and then we played some games, I think I want to say in like October of, of that year after the qualification and our coaches had, you know, they told us like, this is who we intend to play. This is, you know, what it looks like for the next six months. And it was like, we get close to some windows and it just, it didn't happen. And every time it didn't happen, there was an excuse of, you know, it could be any excuse, but there was always some excuse. And, you know, if you're being realistic, there is no excuse because every other team manages to get it done. Um, every other team, regardless of, you know, their rank or whatnot, there's, there's someone out there that, would like to play a friendly in, in certain windows. So I think that was the biggest thing that we were kind of advocating for, for ourselves. Um, and then, yeah, when we do go into camp, I mean, things are, they can be last minute, um, a bit disorganized. You might not have your travel till, you know, five hours before you're meant to go on the plane. So these are things like for us, it's like, it's just professionalism um, mm -hmm. and being able to show up and, you know, just be focused on, on the game. And then, you know, we can dive into outstanding payments, things like that, that have lingered. Um, obviously, we tried to, you know, have as many of these conversations before the World Cup um, and, you know, made a conscious decision as a group that once we kind of got into that 10 day window of being into the tournament that, you know, we needed to pause that in order to be able to focus ourselves. Um, but yeah, those things are ongoing for us. And um I think that that's, yeah, a huge fight that we've had is just, you know, you know, we have contracts and making sure those contracts are being upheld um, and in a timely manner. So, I mean, it is unfathomable to think about preparing for a World Cup and not being able to play games in the FIFA windows. Mm -hmm. um, it is completely unfair to not have the security of knowing, you know, where you're going to be, how you're going to be traveling. Um, these are like unacceptable standards that we are really grateful to have players like you fighting for for better uh, because I, I really feel like it's a global fight that we're all connected in, in raising that standard. Um, and obviously your team started a GoFundMe to uh, try to provide resources for yourself. And all of these things uh, just speak to a lack of professionalism that should be completely unaccepted at a World Cup level and yet you rose above you had a tremendous tournament um and you also brought a lot of attention into meaningful change that will hopefully impact the future of the game for the next generation so for that um i have so much praise um and love for you and for your team and congratulations on yeah thank tournament. you so much thank you so much i think like i said we've we superseded our own expectations and like we know like the sky is really the limit for us and i think that like i said having players in such professional environments like you know, there is a line and it's, it comes from us living that daily. And like, you have to be real about, you know, I'm leaving my club team, you know, to enter what type of environment. And I think from that alone, we're able to just demand more and raise a standard for ourselves. And I mean, this is literally like the beginning when you think about like, you know, a national team, you think about like for the U S like the 99ers, like you talk about where something starts and like yeah. where it begins and where the energy shifts and everything becomes really like exponential. And I think that this is that moment for us and that's really exciting. And so cool. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I wish I could go back 10 years and then experience it all. Like, <laughs> you know, starting from when I was like 17, but um, yeah, it's exciting. And I know for sure, like we're leaving things in a better place and like creating a legacy, which I think is, is huge at the end of the day. Well, you have so much to be proud of. Yeah.
Yeah, we're thanks. all proud of you and we're all behind you. <laughs> thanks, girl. Fighting that good fight. You just let me know if I can be of any help. <laughs> if you want to join our coaching staff or anything like that, you know, let me know. I'd be a terrible coach. <laughs> that would be a step backwards. <laughs> She's like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> to be fair, I think same. So, <laughs> As a professional soccer player, it's crucial that I stay hydrated and drink electrolytes. Well, I recently tried Element and loved the way it tasted and how it made me feel. Element is an electrolyte drink mix, and you don't need to be a pro athlete to enjoy it. You can mix it in a cocktail. You can mix it to cure a hangover. Or if you're like me, you can mix it while watching the World Cup in the middle of the night. Basically, whenever you need a salty electrolyte boost with no sugar, coloring, or artificial ingredients, you need Element. And right now, Element is offering a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serve packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share a packet of Element with a friend. Get yours today at drinkelement.com recap. And remember, this deal is only available through my link. So go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash recap. And the best part is Element offers a no question asked refund. Try it totally risk free. If you don't like it, share it with a salty friend and Element will give you your money back. You have nothing to lose and electrolytes to gain. Big thanks to Element. Now back to the show. All right, so um, now we're joined by the one and only uh, Lindsay Horan. Yay! Welcome um, to the recap. This has been a long time coming. I know you're a big fan of the show, and we um, tried to keep you away for as long as possible because you had a lot of work to do, um, but we're so excited for you to be joining us on our final oh. episode. Of Is this the final? The Recap Show World Cup Edition. We saved the best for last. I knew it. <laughs> It has been a long time coming. We're so excited to have you. And we're gonna start by um, sharing some of your accolades and um, we're gonna do it all from our hearts and memories. So this is oh. Lindsay Michelle Horan, which I just found out was her middle name. The Great Horan. Also known as the Great Horan. Also known as Big Head. The US Women's National <laughs> Team captain. Um, captain. A 2021 US Soccer Player of the Year a World Cup champion, a Champions League champion, a Olympian, and a great dear friend of ours. A, a dear, dear, dear oh. friend. There was more. We might say family. There was more. There was more. There's a lot um, more. Oh, I know. The first um, American player to skip college and go pro, brave and risky Pioneer, move. trailblazer. Um, a player for Olympic Lyon. Um, the current, the only player on the current roster that was playing, playing in Europe, Europe. Um, where it seems, okay, what, anything, that, are you going to contribute? Like there, it seems like there's a lot going on. <laughs> well, um, also I would like to say that um, Lindsay, almost, almost sister-in-law to Tobin. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, Tyler we, will love that we one. did we did try to make it happen um unfortunately you know you can't force those things but we did try to force oh, the so issue bad. you know she's yeah. the same age as jeffrey but anyways so um Lindsay, we're so proud of you we're so Please proud don't make me cry on this okay we're gonna we're gonna try it's not gonna be that hard <laughs> um but <laughs> But really, uh, it was really special watching you. Uh, this was our first time as fans. And there was a moment, and it probably was around the Netherlands game, where um, Chris and I was driving, and she said, you know, I've always like played with these players, but I realized something recently. And I was like, oh, what? And she goes, you know, I'm a Lindsey Horan fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, what's that like? And she's like, I just, I love watching her play. Oh, I, it's that true. is so sweet. It was true. And you know, it was because you all, you've always had like the quality and I always loved playing with you and I could always like feel that and see that. Um, but there was your energy, this World Cup, I felt like you stepped up into the captaincy in such a potent way that thousands of miles away from 
on the couch, I could feel how much it mattered to you and the body language that you started every game with like showed is such incredible leadership that you were like a player that everybody was rooting for. Like the entire country was like, if we're going to do anything in this World Cup, it's going to be because of Lindsay Horan. <laughs> and also, I heard a lot of compliments on your very thick ponytail. <laughs> Best pony in the yeah. game. <laughs> My mom or someone was telling me about that. And I'm like, why is that a thing? That's never been a thing. Should be a thing. Great hair. But thank you. That was so nice. <laughs> um, so we see you as this like big captain, but take me back to the first day actually that, that we met. Oh well, what was that like? <laughs> of course you're going to bring this up. Um, okay. Tobin and I met in Paris when she signed for PSG and I had already been there what like five months um and Tobin came in she was she was coming in to like say hi to everyone I think we we're in our gym like our <laughs> yeah. like terrible gym um it's in like this little mini trailer and I was in there and well one I was like a massive Tobin fan so I was just like oh, I need to play it as cool as possible because I'm like <laughs> fangirling really hard right now and and there wasn't like a lot of like this is sad but there weren't a lot of like women's players that I was like that like much of a fangirl over and so I was like okay play it cool play it cool I'm not gonna be that loser and, <laughs> and I'm like the only American so it would have been great if I like went up to Tobin and I welcomed her more but I I think I just like shook your hand no and said hi you were Did the I? last person you, you were like were in the back around. hiding it wasn't <laughs> Well, yeah, I wasn't gonna like <laughs> jump out and sprint towards you. So I, even though you whatever, wanted to, I was the last. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> um, and then I said hi, and I think that's literally all I said. Yes. And and then Tobin forced me to be her friend. It's true, I did. But yeah. yeah, and then for the Which, next like two years, we just watched Vampire Diaries and and drank tea together. Yeah, you were. <laughs> I, I literally really was like, I was not letting you go. From that moment that you said hello, I was like by your side no. every and step of the way. You're also the only reason me and Kosa are friends. Yes. Because I, I didn't like her. I know. <laughs> <laughs> See, I brought everyone together. All those, all I those know, internationals. It was amazing. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's Tobin, so crazy. Tobin would like come to my apartment, always force her way in, <laughs> say that we're watching shows, sleep on our couch. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was all Tobin. Okay, so from my vantage point, I feel like you two have like a very special relationship that obviously grew from the moment where you were hiding in the back and didn't want to say hi to her <laughs> to when she was crashing on your couch uninvited. Um, but what do you yeah. think that your relationship with Tobin kind of did for your career and kind of just like you you as you were growing up in a foreign country? Um, well, I'm going to do this without crying. <laughs> I, I told myself I'm coming on this show and I'm not going to cry. Um, it was, it was crazy. Cause like we joke about it. Like Tobin like forced us to be friends. I would like to say best friends at the time because it was my only friend. Um, but it, I think it like brought me out more as a player and a person there in, in Paris. Cause I like just didn't speak. I was so shy and yeah, and it, it's hard to like be that kind of person and like live that kind of life where I'm nonstop skyping my mom it was skype back then my gosh and <laughs> and like not not enjoying my life over there and if you're not enjoying your life like how can you be this footballer and like actually enjoy everything on the field as well um so i think when tobin came like it literally opened up everything for me um and she like made me believe <laughs> that i could be who i was like on the field and and everything and then it it kind of translated like i started you know i was i was a starter there like we didn't have anyone really competing with me at the time because it was a new project at psg so i think that started things off for me and i got like my first call up with the national team and everything and tobin was kind of just she was just there the entire time um and it was like forcefully she was there but she stuck <laughs> by me the entire time so um yeah i could i could go into so many details but if if Tobin, Tobin hadn't come to PhD, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> you would be day, exactly honestly. you would be exactly where you are. No. There's nope. <laughs> no, but no, no, no. <laughs> I 
I do, I will say though that there was just like an instant connection because of our love, our deep, deep love of football, which sounds strange because that's what we do. Um, but it is strange in in our kind of women's like football culture for for that to exist. Like I, I have yet to meet, I think, anyone other than you at our level mm-hmm. that shares that same passion and love like we had identical like childhood bedrooms growing up like when I saw your childhood bedroom I was like oh my gosh it's like like uh, obviously yours was a messy shrine mine was like an arsenal shrine um (laughs) but it was like uh, yeah it was like this like deep passion and love for the game and wanting to get better and you know you you reference you being shy off the field but on the field you were never shy ever and Mm -hmm. that was a place that you really expressed yourself and from the very beginning I knew that you were so special so talented um you know few people like people that have followed your journey they know that you started as a number number nine as a goal scorer I still to this day say Lindsay Horan is one of the best box finishers in the world and like plus one plus one to that over here and that's that's high high praise from (laughs) from the the maestro finisher um but but no it's funny because then like your transition into a midfielder was insane at that level too to have to do that transition and even further back as a six and then you know finally we got to see you in your perfect position as the number eight for the national team leading that team in a world cup what was that moment like to captain the u.s women's national team at a world cup Oh my gosh. It was, um, it was insane. Like, obviously I'd been wearing the captain's armband with Becky leading up uh, to the tournament, but, um, it was such a different feeling, you know, going out in that first game in the Vietnam game. Um, or like even Blackco telling me that I was going to be captain. Um, I think I, I actually started crying to Blackco because that was just, it, it's an insane moment. It's like, you are putting full trust and responsibility into me to lead this team. And I maybe never like looked at myself as that kind of player. Um, and then, you know, I was kind of just like, screw this. Like, this is someone that I've always wanted to be. This is a goal that I've had, which I didn't tell a lot of people. Like, that's just something that I've always wanted to do because it's weird. Like when I, when I get that role, when I get that like leadership role, I think I'm a better player um, because I, I take so much focus off just like me individually playing. Like I want to help the team. I want to make them better. And I think I'm very good at that. And, but I feel like I can't do that when, if I don't have that armband, which is a bad thing. I know. Um, But I think (laughs) that's because you you got that number nine ego in you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. There's always going to be that. But so I think, I think when I got at this tournament and that first game, I was just like, you know, I'm going to, this is my responsibility. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that everyone's in a good place. And like, obviously I'm going to put myself in a good place and I will always do that for this team, but make sure I touch on every individual that's going out there, especially the young ones going into this tournament. And it was amazing. It was like one of the most emotional experiences walking out for that first time. Um, And yeah, I, I can't really describe it, but captioning the, U.S. Women's National Team is like you look at the 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 past captains. It's like this is a massive role, and you have to take, you have to take so much responsibility on and off the field. And I was ready for it. So yeah, it was. You my were God. you were really ready for <laughs> so it. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you played and you played like it. You know, I could see like that's like what I could see so clearly was that like you were demonstrating with your bravery and your body to like raise the team yeah. up. And like everyone obviously saw that in the game against the Netherlands. It was like such a like a quintessential moment to see I mean, it. We talk about iconic US women's dash team goals that give the whole country the feels. You gave the whole country the feels, the football feels. All right, so now we are going to take a break, and there's no better way to recover than with our friends at UFOS, and we're going to get into our community questions. Drum roll, please. Okay. JD from Alabama asks, if you could have a lifetime supply of something, what would it be? Ego waffles. 
<laughs> Did you see the question? No. That was such a quick answer. Yeah. I've you been... never eat egg waffles. <laughs> yeah, but. What? I've seen you eat one I feel like egg you're not waffle really allowed in, in our home. 10 years. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, Sarah from Maryland asks, what has been the most unexpected part of filming the recap show? Probably how funny you are. Oh, thank you. I was thinking that in my head, and I was like, I wonder if she's going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did. I mean, not only do you know you're funny, but like everyone else knows you're funny now, too. And it's a lot of pressure for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah. But like, you've gotten like even funnier. I don't know if you're like just. I'm in a groove. Are you trying more? Anyway. Oh, last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh. hmm. Weird. Uh, Tara from Los Angeles asks, <laughs> I hear you're pretty good at Pokemon. So here's this my question. This is the Pokemon thing that you've been all been plotting. <laughs> you're facing a Charizard, and you've only got a Squirtle and a Diglett on your bench. Who are you playing? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what she's talking about. Well, do you want to explain? Wait, are you a fan of Pokemon? Um, I have a hard time with the word fan, but I enjoy Pokemon. Do you play Pokemon? Yep. Are you I competitive? Mm, among friends and family, yes. What do you think makes you so good at Pokemon? Determination. No. Gotta catch them all. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for sending in uh, your community questions. You know, when we started this segment, I was like, oh, I don't want to be asked silly questions. But you all were so heartfelt and meaningful, and this ended up being one of the best parts of the show. So thank you, and thank you to our friends at UFOS. And I hope everyone who got a pair of UFOS is enjoying them. Throughout the course of the tournament, um, you talked about finding the joy. And I felt like you said that from like a place of leadership where you were like, I need to find the joy, but I also need to help everybody find joy. And obviously, you know that this is like the passion of my life is like to find peace and joy <laughs> in hard environments. Um, so I'd love to hear from you like throughout, throughout this tournament, which I know was extremely challenging. Um, how do you think you find joy in football and in particular, when things are not going well, how do you create joy for yourself and for your teammates? You know, I think it's such a hard one because it's a tournament. It's you're going each game where all you want to do is win and it doesn't really matter how you play. It's about winning. Um, and it's, it's each game at a time. And it's like, how do you like the joy is winning? Like you always look at it in that, that kind of way. But I felt like the first I mean, the first game, there was there were bits and pieces of joy, but we still were at our best. Um, and it was like looking at those three group stage games and we were just like, you, you felt it in the team. You felt this like tense feeling and people were just not enjoying their football or they weren't enjoying individually playing. And there's just so much going on in their head. And, you know, I sat, I think I had like a press conference and that was like the first thing that came to my mind was like, there's no joy. Like I, I haven't like truly enjoyed um Mo like a enough moments on the field where I like I came off the field and I was like oh mm -hmm. I love that game like mm -hmm. it's <laughs> and that's hard to say, say a lot in the world cup uh so so that's where I was like I was finding it very difficult to be like yeah we just need to find the joy again and like we're gonna be great like that's a very hard thing to do mm -hmm. but I think leading leading into the Sweden game I remember like you know our game plan and the scout and like all these things that you know, we, we go through, you guys know, we go through. And I remember coming in with the team um, before the game. And I was just like, I guys, I had like pregame speeches. This was so wild of me. Like I never do that, but I did. <laughs> oh my I, know. <laughs> I know. I know it was so out there. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like, I had a, had one against Vietnam and I was like, where, where did that come from? Um, but <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember going to the Sweden game and I was just like, guys, we are so good. Every single one of us is so good. We, when we're confident, when we're brave, when we're actually enjoying football, um, we're at our best. It's a very hard thing to do. But I think the one thing I like said, I was just like, every time like someone gets the ball, make like each person should have like three or four options. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always like a thing you say in football. But when you have that, like when you see that everyone wants the ball mm -hmm. 
And that was like one of my other main points was like, everyone sit in their heads right now and say, I want the ball at all times in this game. I'm not that. hiding. I want the ball. If I'm going to make a mistake, I want the ball again. And I remember actually Tobin saying that to me in the Olympics. Like she kept saying to me, like, I don't care if you make a mistake, go get on the ball again. So like, that was like my main message to the team in that game. And it kind of all just like came together. Like the first, you know, maybe the first 10 minutes we were under a little bit of pressure, but like once we started being confident, everyone wanting the ball, there was bravery. Yep. You saw it in every single player, like you saw the joy. Yeah. Um, so that was a long winded answer, but. No, I love that. I love that because like what I like get fixed on is this idea of like, if you search for joy, then it becomes more elusive, mm -hmm. right? But I think what you did there was like actually take the focus off the joy and put it onto something tangible that people could do. Yeah. And like focus, like a yeah. mantra, I want the ball. I love that. Really and then it's also a, like a behavior that is contagious. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. that's when it, I start to think about like, what really is joy in sport because mm -hmm. it is like tied to greatness and excellence in winning and yeah. um, really only retrospectively do you like look back on things and like see the reward, the full reward of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you've had now a couple of weeks since you've been home from the World Cup. Do you think now that you look back on it that there was anything you could have done to change the result or anything you would have wanted to do differently to help the team win? You know, it's so funny. I, well, I just talked to Tobin about this because it's like, it goes in and comes in so many ways after the, the World Cup. Like, one, you're disappointed, you're upset, you're angry, and then you sit there and you think, especially as a captain, you're just like, I had so much responsibility, like, what more could have I done to help the team? And I sit there and I'm just like, maybe that speech that I had before the Sweden game, like, could that have been, you know, before the Netherlands game or before the Vietnam game or, or whatever. And I think it's so hard. Yeah. There's always like little things that you can, um, you can fix and you can look back on, but I think individually, I tried to do that as much as possible with each of the players. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember I like made it a point, like I want to help Soph Smith as much as possible in this tournament, because I think she has a lot of pressure like on her back and, I want to make sure she's in a good place and like some of the younger players are in a really good place because they're going to have massive roles. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, could I have done more to help those players? Because I don't think we got the absolute best out of, out of some of them because of the way that we were set up and, and some of the things that we did in the game. But at this point, it's like, you're just like killing yourself. Like yeah. I'm killing myself for the next, for the last two weeks. Like what, what the heck could I have done to, to yeah. help or to push or to to push our playing style or to push this bravery and at the end of the day it's like you're set up in a structure to to do this and like here's here's your opportunity individually like just go play within this structure but if you're not set up to you know like the, the game against Sweden I don't think we were necessarily set up to play the way that we played mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that was just us like finally coming together and being like this is what yep. we're gonna do and then it worked and then it's like okay keep doing it mm -hmm. yeah like could that have happened earlier like maybe yeah <laughs> but yeah, yeah i a, i think it's a really tough one yeah and i i always i i shared this with you that like i love the responsibility that you put on your back and like having that captain's armband um for the team for the success of the team i think it just shows such great character in you um but i really truly believe that that you should have so much peace because you know i probably can count less than less than a hand on a single hand of individuals that I felt like were prepared for a World Cup. And your performances showed that you individually were prepared mm -hmm. and ready for a World Cup. You were prepared and ready to win a World Cup. And I think about that because I'm like, why, why weren't there more individuals that I felt like when they stepped out on the field like that they were going that they were an individual that had prepared in a way that's needed to win a world cup when you talk when you when you look at kind of the collective because i think that you yourself like you're always going to be like self critical like what could i have done more what how could i have helped the team more but if you talk about kind of that the collective process and the learnings that you just had what do you think is next for this team like what didn't you have in whether it be the preparation or the performances, 
what wasn't there that you would like to see be there moving forward? <clears throat> it's such a, again, these are like questions that I asked myself in the last two weeks. Um, you know, when I won, when I think about a World Cup, I think about you win a World Cup in moments, like moments in every single game. Um, and there, there had been moments in every single game for us to win. Like mm -hmm. there are moments in the Netherlands game that we could have won. Mm -hmm. There are moments in the Vietnam game where we could have made it a seven to eight zero game. Yep. And then you look back and you're like, oh, we could have been <laughs> playing South Africa in the round of 16. Um, like we, we didn't win those big moments. And I think back to 2019 and I'm like, we won every single one of those big moments. Like whenever they came in every single game with the route that we had, which was mm -hmm. so difficult, we won those moments. And I'm like, like I just spoke to Tyler, my fiance about this. And I'm like, how did we prepare for those moments? And I think we were put in a place that like, that's usually on the individual. It's like Pino scoring every single PK that we had throughout the intern mm -hmm. that she was like, she was prepared to win that moment, you know, but I think we were put in a place to be prepared for those. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, how, how does the coaching staff do that? Like, what's the, you know what I mean? Like, it's, that's such a hard, hard thing for me, but I think we actually were, we were fully fully prepared for that back in in 2019 so i think like now with this team with like a new coach coming in and olympics very quickly yeah. um and and now leading into a, a another four-year cycle it's like what's like the main the main goal here one it's like do we just prepare for a four-year cycle leading into the next world cup or like do you focus on hey we want to go win gold mm -hmm. and you don't ask me that because i'm a player that hasn't won a gold medal at the olympics so i want to yeah. win that yeah. um and it so for me it's just like how can you prepare for the next four-year cycle but also in your mind you're like i'm I, we go winning a gold medal that's what this team is about you yeah. know so yeah. so it's kind of like when a coach comes in it's like Hey, how, how do we get the best out of every single individual player putting the most simple, not simple tactics, but simple yeah. <laughs> simplicity into a, a 10, 10 day camp every few weeks, yep. every few months, yep. you know, and getting the best out of your team and without overcomplicating everything, because yep. I could talk about the last four year cycle and we don't need to get into every single thing, but that's not what we did. Yep. Like we, we, we did not get the best out of every single individual. I don't think everyone was fully prepared and that's on us as well. Yep. Yeah. I, I think you make a great point that we didn't get the best out of every single individual. I think all of us as athletes, like we look back at every possible thing we could have done or changed or tweaked. Yeah. Uh, but I want you to know that like from our perspective and like Tobin and I have like an inside outside perspective because like we know exactly what the preparation looked like for each game. Um, we know kind of like the signals from what the staff saying, like we kind of like know how it goes. Like I think that you shined in yeah. an environment where there was very little light. And I think that like you can have a lot of peace with how you carried the team through that tournament because even being able to bring the team together in the way to put on that performance um, after the, the prior three performances was like super inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, you'll, you'll find peace in the lessons that you learn. Um, yeah. And you'll find confidence. Like I already see you yeah. taking so many big steps, like in terms of your leadership and your confidence, look, your game is up there with like easily in the top 10 players in the world, definitely needs to move into the top five players of the world this year. <laughs> no pressure. We know what your goal is. And and that's that's your level of football, right? So like that's just baseline yeah. for you at this point. And now as a leader, you have this massive, like you just led the US Women's National Team in a World Cup. Like you just had so many learnings as that. And we know that there's there's this group, this younger group of players that you now have to lead into, you know, another cycle of major tournaments. Um, and I think all of these learnings are really important to you as you continue to build up the the player and the the person that you are. Um, but it's been absolutely a joy to watch you grow and to watch you shine. It's one of the greatest joys of my life. Um, <laughs> and I, she's not gonna no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. She's, she's not well, gonna I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> and 
But I, I do want to say, though, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that part of your career. And this is coming down to the little things. You said a good point, like simplify. And I thought this was really smart of you because everybody was like, kind of like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's mine? And you were like, I'm going to simplify. And we talked about like set pieces, right? And you were like, I'm going to score off a corner. And do you remember that? Do you remember that yeah. you literally texted Tobin the night before yeah. the game and you said, I'm going to score on a set piece. If I recall, it was a set piece. I mean, I could look back on my phone and I'm pretty sure I said, like, I know you are. I know. But it was, like, such I, manifestation. I, was it set piece or was it corner? It, it was that, a corner. It was a corner. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, but it was crazy, too, because I had been talking to you about it and I had been talking to Tyler about it because, well, one, probably, like, four or five months ago, he was like, you're crap at set pieces now. You need to get better. <laughs> and because, like, I'm one of the most lethal in the air. Like, how are you not lethal. scoring more goals on should score yeah, every time set pieces yeah yeah and so we like obviously came up with a plan and <laughs> then me and you had been talking about it and i was like okay i'm a, i know i'm gonna score yeah it was and weird that was so wild it, so wild it was picture so wild. perfect i mean if you could write a movie script that's how it would be written well you know what's funny is like i could have gotten a yellow card right before that and totally for the next game but we uh, talked about that after, too in the text messages <laughs> yeah Calm down, Lynn. And but about the fact that. that you were, could have gotten the other person in the party who also has a hot head. Yeah. This, this is, whole thing this was played true. out. But, but you know, you know, Julie had come up to me and was just like, "We heard the that." The only way to like, yeah, the only way that you can like shut them up right now or like make this yours is you scoring this goal. And I was like, so lame. And that's right. that's the type. Of, <laughs> That's the type of responsibility, and that's why, like, you know, when, when we were, like, younger and we were playing together, I, I was like, get on the ball, get on the ball, get on the ball mm -hmm. again, you know, because, like, yeah. you're a player that needs to be trusted. You become a better player yeah. when you're trusted, and I think we just touched the surface of it in, in yeah. this world championship, which is really exciting. Um, and, like, yeah. that's what you want as a player, and that's what you thrive on, and your ability is there to be able to handle it and manage it, which is is really exciting because I, I really think that we're just getting started here. Yep. We're just getting started, fam. And it, and it could be that that goal was the goal that you surpassed me in header goals <laughs> with the U.S. Women's National Team. So congratulations. Actually, you know what? You I couldn't know, find it. So you know I'm what, this Lindsay? Up. This I couldn't has always find been a, This has always <laughs> been a thing. I don't know when this started between you two, but it was like Chris being like, "Well, I still have yeah. more header goals than Lindsay." <laughs> I have a lot of header goals. I don't know why it just happened that way. <laughs> Which is so funny because for club, like that's all I had was header goals. <laughs> good times, oh my but the sky is the limit for you. We are so yeah. proud of you. She's she's limitless. You're right. Not even the sky can limit Lindsay Not Horan. Not even the sky can Lindsay limit Lindsay Michelle Horan <laughs> cannot be limited. Well, this is the final episode of the Recap Show World Cup Edition. So it is a nice moment to reflect on what we've built. Um, I know that we are both so grateful to the audience, the community that has supported us throughout this project. It's been so much fun um, and so many learnings. Um, but, you know, we set out with a mission mm -hmm. to create impact. Yep. Um, and the whole vision came from your mind palace. Um, oh, like a year ago, less than a year ago. Uh, so do you want to tell everybody kind of what your vision was for creating um, a media division and how we got here? Remedia really started as, you know, the mission to reimagine the way women are seen and experienced in sports. And the way that I always describe it is that sports currently live in like this house, the sports house, right? And men's sports was the first thing that was sports to us, you know, first leagues, men playing it, like women weren't, weren't really accepted as athletes, all, all of that history. So this house was built, you know, for and by men. And then, you know, once everybody was kind of like, okay, women play sports too, cool. We essentially became this like, you know, awkward addition or garage part of the house, of this sports house. And, and nobody really cared about us. They didn't invest in us, but they were like, I guess like you can 
be an add-on mm -hmm. to us. And mm -hmm. we were kind of raked in with media rights and, and nothing was there for us. You know, everything like fit weird and, and didn't represent us. But so we, we need to build new structures that look and feel like us. And, and that's what Re Media was built for. It was to create a new house that looks and feels like us, the people playing, and also our community that's watching. One thing that we ended up doing is going to find partners, value-aligned partners, who believed in us. And Ally was actually the first brand yeah. to say, hey, we're going to take a risk on you and we're going to bet on you yep. uh, because they're deeply invested in women's sports. Yes. Um, and they kind of gave us that little bit of supercharge. Yeah, they did. And Ally has their Watch to Change initiative, which is really about like the simple act for people to, to tune in Yeah, and how important that is. We have the power, um, the more people that watch, the more um, investment we can get into more media equity. Yeah, so. and when I thought of the people that were invested in the space, because we talk about brands, companies that live at the intersection of sports progress and equity, and you look at the NWSL, and the NWSL is growing and and is is amazing what they've been able to do in the last couple of years and a lot of it is because of the visibility and the media pledge that ally has done and they're everywhere if you watch the nwsl which it's still too difficult in my opinion to find it to love it to watch it but that's part of this goal so um, we're going to reimagine we're going to reimagine <laughs> it and but if you do if you are a fan of women's sports or if you are a fan of the nwsl you know that Ally is committed to it. And, you know, obviously the idea with the media division is to make a hundred shows like this. Um, we're not gonna host them all. We're gonna have awesome athletes, yeah. analysts come in um, and share their stories. Um, but when we started with this show, um, it, it was really special and, and it's really close to our hearts. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what the recap show means to you. What, what really like infuriated me is that this idea that we, and we, we had this with our pay equity lawsuit where we kept going into rooms that said, you know, the revenue's not there, the, like, the interest isn't there. Like, these are just the market realities of sports. People don't want to watch women's sports, all this stuff. And you start to believe it when you go into those rooms and they say it over and over again. But then there's like something in us, right? That like, fundamentally it was like that's not true mm -hmm. no you're i see it and and know your value and fight for it and then we just realized like not only do we have to go into those rooms and we have to like repeatedly hear that but we can go into different rooms and we can build rooms mm -hmm. and i think that was the part that like really changed this dynamic for me if you look at the show if you look at the types of conversations we're having, the gal culture. Like the best part about making the show is it's distinctly different. I laugh, you know, with the, with our, our fun creative team here because, you know, now I've gone out, you know, on the street and like I've been identified as Tobin the soccer player for so long that if somebody was to run up to me, they'd be like, oh my gosh, I love like watching the way you play. play or watching you play. And it's like, as soon as this show started, there was like a change in energy and, you know, people are coming up and being like, oh my gosh, I love your show. And these aren't the same people that were coming up to me saying, I love the way that you play soccer. And that's the, that encapsulates what gal culture is to me and what is so powerful about women's sports. And if anybody tries to think or tell you that women's sports is small or it's not popular, not desirable or something, like just move on because it's not even worth the time explaining why it is, because we're so past explaining to people what women's sports is. If you look at this, if you take this World Cup as an example, all the record breaking, all of the interest, everything around it, we're past the point of having to explain to people the value that is women's sports. Mm -hmm. Now we're just creating it. Um, I kind of want to leave with the, uh, a deep sense of gratitude yes. that we have for all the people that have tuned into this show, um, that have you know subscribed, liked, reviewed, um, shared our stories, helped us amplify this message. Uh, for all those people, thank you thank yes. you um and what do you what would you say to them if they want to continue supporting women's sports watch engage love them love this show support this show we're trying to get to fifty thousand <laughs> subs um in oh. order to continue the recap show <laughs>
As you all know by now, we like to end each show by looking ahead to one upcoming match that I'm personally excited to watch. But with the World Cup over, I'll make a different kind of prediction. I predict that more episodes of The Recap Show are coming soon. To make it happen, subscribe to the Reink YouTube page today, and thanks for watching.